in Romans chapter 7 here tonight. I'd like to read the first four verses. I'll give you just a moment to turn there as we prepare our hearts for the hearing of the Word of God tonight. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. God bless you. We're going to stop right there. You may be seated in the house of God. You may say, Pastor, what's that all about? Well, let me just tell you like this. Romans chapter 7, if you look at this in its context tonight, is a very powerful passage of Scripture that it is imperative for us to be able to understand. Now, why would I say that? Because we live in a world, church, are you with me? Say good amen. amen. We live in a world where people get saved, they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, they surrender their heart and their life to Him, and they receive forgiveness for their sins, and all of that guilt and all of that shame from a life of sin is taken away instantly, and they are set apart as a child of God. They are set apart as a Christian. They are no longer an unbeliever. They are no longer unregenerate. But now, by the grace of God, they are a child of God. By faith, they are a saint of God. It's nothing that I've done. It's nothing that I've attempted to do. But my faith was placed in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's all about what He's done. I get grace into the body of Christ. That's how I got in. That's how you got in. If you're saved tonight, we were graced into this body. We didn't work our way into this body. We were graced into this body. But then, after we are graced into the body of Christ, we then have this process of sanctification that takes place. And that's when we walk in newness of life because we are saved by the grace of God. And this is where a lot of Christians are falling prey today. This is where a lot of Christians are falling victim to the tactics of the devil. Your adversary, the enemy, he has tactics and he's trying to come against you and Christians will fall prey to the devil when they try to lean upon their own good works, when they try to lean on their own righteousness, their own goodness, or something other than what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And then we start clocking off this list, this religious list of going to church and praying and reading the Bible and whatever it may be. And all all of those are good things. Those are good disciplines. Those are things that every child of God needs to do and you need to do that faithfully but you've got to understand today that is not where you're going to find the ultimate victory. You're not going to have the victory without it but that's not where you're going to find the ultimate victory. So I want to give you tonight two guaranteed places of victory in your life that you could find regardless of what's going on around you, regardless of what's taking place in your life, regardless what's happening in society or culture. I want to give you a couple of these. There's two places that a person can be. You're either, first of all, let me say this, you are either under the grace of God or you are under the law. That's the only two places that a person can be. Your faith is in one or the other. It's either in the cross and what Christ has done or it's in something else. Some other work. Some other goodness. Now, the Bible teaches us that the law of the Lord is good. Converting the sinner, but it has no power to deliver you. Why? Because that's what Jesus has done. That was what Jesus took care of when He went to the cross. Now, here's the thing. Some of us have got to get deprogrammed in order to get the right stuff inside of us. How many of you know what I'm talking about tonight? There's an old cliche, and it goes like this. Practice makes perfect. Yep. But I want to tell you tonight, 
that I prefer to say practice makes permanent because if you learn to do something That's the right. wrong way and then you keep right on doing that, yep. you're going to take the attitude that says, well, I've always done it this way. Right. Well, maybe you've always done it that way, but that doesn't mean that it's the right way. Amen. Just because you've already uh, always done it that way. So yep. I'm going to challenge us tonight in this place because... I know many of us have been saved for a very long time, but I want you to know you'll never get over the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. You'll never get over the cross. Amen. You'll never get over it. There's not some other means. There's not some other method. There's not some other way. Amen. After we get saved, that keeps us in a place where we are victorious over sin. You'll never get to the place where you could say, okay, Lord, well, I'm done with the cross. The cross got me this far. Now it's time for me to move on. I'm good, God. I've got this. But you know, that's the way a lot of people try to operate yeah. in their life. They'll say, well, thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thanks for pulling me out of the ditch. But I'm good now, God. I've got it from here. <laughs> and we're trying to drive our own selves. But here's the problem tonight. The same thing that it took to get you saved is the same thing it takes to keep you saved. That's right. Amen. And if you try to get around that, then what you do, my dear friend, is you take yourself and you effectively put yourself back under the law. So living under the law is done by placing my faith in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's done. That's why Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he said, Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, yeah. and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't desire the weak and beggarly elements of this world. Now somebody might say, Hey, I was doing good. I was reading my Bible. Well, that's great. You should read your Bible. But if you were reading your Bible to try to keep yourself saved, you could read that thing from Genesis to Revelation and it's not going to do anything for you. It's not going to get you there. Right. It can get tight, but it's still right. right man. Amen? Yes. Listen, there's only one thing that your flesh recognizes and that's self. That's the only thing that your flesh recognizes. Self. And you know what the Bible says about it? The flesh needs to be crucified. The flesh needs to be put to death. We need to mortify the deeds of the body. Walk in the Spirit and will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, you've got to understand that your greatest obstacle for you to overcome in this Christian life is yourself. Amen! Yes. Living in the grace of God comes by placing my faith exclusively in the cross of Jesus Christ and that guarantees me the victory. Yes. Placing my faith in something other than Jesus Christ will guarantee me failure. Now notice what the Bible says here in verse number 1. Paul writing here, he says, For I speak to them that know the law. In other words, it's not like you didn't know the Word of God. It's not like you didn't know what God said. Or it's not like you didn't know what was right and what was wrong. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. Somebody says, oh, I'm saved, I'm free, everything's good. But has anyone else in here ever had trouble with that old man trying to come back up? Yeah. <laughs> like maybe yesterday? Well, you know what? Hey, listen, I appreciate you being honest about that. You know why? Because God already knows about it. We might as well be honest. We're not going to hide it from Him. Because as long as we think we can do it, then we're putting our faith in ourselves. And if you've got to depend on yourself... 
you're in bad shape. I mean, you might be able to do it a little while, but pretty soon, you're going to be wore out. Pretty soon, you will have done all that you know to do. So with this in mind, Romans is reminding us that this battle will continue so long as we are on this earth. So it's better for us to understand what to do with this old man and where to place our faith. Otherwise, we'll continue in this vicious cycle of guaranteed failure over and over and over again. So, if you try to live under the law, if you try to live under something other than Christ and what He's done on the cross, you will become dominated by that and you will become controlled by that. In 2 Timothy chapter number 2, Timothy was dealing with all kinds of stuff going on in the church. And this is riveting because Paul sends Timothy this letter and he tells him, flee youthful lust. Flee those youthful lusts which war against the soul. And now there were those who were not obeying God's word but notice what it says in verse number 26. It says, And that they may recover themselves from the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Not your will, but his will. In other words, if you keep rebelling against God and refusing to put your faith in the right place and you keep having a rebellious attitude toward the plan and the pattern of God, then this scripture right here just simply, it doesn't imply it. It comes right out and it states it very plainly that you can be captive, held captive against your will by the devil. Because the devil will never recognize your power. The devil will never recognize your name. The devil will never recognize your authority. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? You've got to have someone who's greater than yourself. You've got to have someone who's greater than yourself to get the devil's attention. And thank God there's somebody who's already taken care of that for us and his name's Jesus. But that doesn't mean that just because we got saved that we put Jesus on the sidelines and we don't call on him to be our victory day by day by day by placing our faith and our trust in him every day of our life. And if we're not very careful, we'll become just like those children of Israel who got tired of the manna that fell in the wilderness. God was blessing. God was taking care of them. God was sending the manna down. And they murmured. And they complained. And they griped. And they criticized. And they got tired of the manna. And the manna was a type of Christ. The bread of life that came down from heaven. They got tired of it. And if you're not very careful, you'll come to a service like this and hear the preaching and the enemy will whisper in your ear and tell you, you've already heard all that before. You better just pass that on by. That's what the devil will tell you. But I'm telling you tonight, there is no other place for complete and total victory in your life than the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, how do I fix this situation? Look to the cross. How do I get free from this addiction? Look to the cross. Well, how long do I need to do that? As long as you want to have the victory. Look to the cross. It's not Jesus trying to do something. He's already said it's finished. Now, the fight right now is over where you put, uh, place your faith and your trust and your confidence because the devil knows if he can get you to place your faith in something else mm -hmm. other than the cross of Jesus Christ, He can mess you up. That's right. Yes. So let's go a little further with this. The lifestyle of the person 
that's given over to living under the law, something other than Jesus Christ, is not what Christ said in John chapter 10 when He said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. That's to keep us away from things that the cross has provided for us that we might have that abundant life that Christ spoke of. That's the devil's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy and to keep you away from that abundant life. And if you're not careful, while you may truly love the Lord, if you're not careful, religion will creep in to your life. And then what does religion do? Religion will set you up a list of do's and don'ts and things that you need to do in order to be saved or stay saved. And some churches even have lists that you have to do or don't do or they won't let you go to church there. So, you know, they'll say if you don't do things a certain way, you can't be a part of us. But if you place your faith in your religious rule keeping, then you're placing yourself under the law and then you'll only be worthy if you keep that list of rules and do's and don'ts. Now I'm not talking to you about God's law. If God's law, if God's word says for us to do something or not to do it, then we need to be obedient to that. Because that's a part of the gospel. That's a part of the Lord Jesus. I mean, that's a part of, of what we need to do to live a fulfilled life. I'm not saying that you're saved by what you do or by keeping the law. I'm not saying that. We're saved by grace through faith. But if you are saved, you're going to have a desire if Christ is the Lord of your life, listen, if Christ is the Lord of your life, you're going to do those things that please Him, right. that, that bring Him glory. Yes. We want to glorify Jesus Christ and not ourselves That's and right. not somebody else. But Amen. Christ, listen, if you'll remember in the Word of God, Christ did not pray that Peter would never get into any more trouble. He said, Peter, no, I'm praying for you that your faith will fail not. That's why I'm praying for you, Peter. Because you're going to mess up. I've got news for you here tonight. Whether it's one day or a thousand days, you're going to mess up. That's the reason why you better look to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not look to yourself and not to your own goodness. Come on tonight. That's right. Why? Because sooner or later, you're going to run into a fight. And if the enemy can get you to shift your faith to something other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified on the old rugged cross, He's got you right where He wants you. Now the Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is... Amen. It's exactly right. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's what the Word says. So we sin when we place our faith in something other than Christ for our daily living in this world. Not just our salvation experience, but our sanctification experience. As long as the believer tries to live by some other means, tries to live under the law, whatever it may be, whether it's your own list of do's and don'ts, whether it's trying to be saved by your own obedience. You're not saved by your obedience. The Bible says we're saved by the obedience of one in Romans chapter 5. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. Who was that one? It was Jesus. It was Jesus. Now that's how we're saved. But if you're saved, you have a desire to be obedient to God. You have a desire to glorify God. There's too many people today who are dependent on other things. Some of them may say, I'm dependent on my education. I've got a PhD, or I've got a lot of money, or I've got a lot of power, or I've got a lot of fame, and prestige, or wealth, and health, or whatever. Make your own list. But if you put your faith in that, let me tell you something tonight. Sickness does not care. It will afflict the rich. It will afflict the poor. It will afflict whoever. But I'll tell you who it respects. Somebody who's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Come on, brother. Amen. That's why there's two doctors that I've heard of and that I know of right now that will tell you it's God that healed us yes. because we were trusting in Him. You see, it's all about where your faith is at tonight. Amen. Amen. 
And now, <coughs> there may be people who don't understand this terminology that I'm about to give you, <coughs> but I want to try to explain to you for just a few minutes here in this service about spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. Because the Bible says we cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. You'll love the one, hate the other. So Romans chapter 7, Paul uses this illustration, and that's what this is. This is an illustration of a woman who is married to a husband, and then she goes to marry another husband. Now, if you look at this in context, this is not about divorce and all of these other things. Paul spoke about divorce in another place. Jesus spoke about divorce in Matthew chapter 9. So if you want to read about all that, you can go to those verses and read what the Bible says about divorce. But this is about whether or not... Now, if you read this on it, it's because the Bible is going to bear this out. I'm not giving you my opinion on this. This is about whether or not you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ Amen. or whether you've placed it in something else. These are the two husbands. Christ and the law. That's what Romans chapter 7 is about. They're the two husbands. That's why Paul said she should be called an adulteress because she married two men. There's many people in the church today or who at least profess to be Christians who are married to two men. They're trying to live for Jesus. At the same time, they're trying to live by some other means. And I'm just going to tell you tonight, it's not going to work. It won't work. They're trying to keep their faith in Jesus Christ and the work of the cross. And they say, well, praise God I'm saved. But then they'll turn right around and try to live for themselves or to live under the law. Are, are y'all hearing this tonight? Yes. Come on, brother. They get up from their salvation experience and somebody says, well, hey, you've got to read 10 chapters a day. You've got to do this type of prayer. You've got to do this over here. You've got to do that over there. And then this blanket of heaviness comes upon you because you're trying to live the way some other husband wants you to live. And it will never work. Why? Because the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. If you're saved and you're in the church, Christ is our husband. Amen. That's we're married right. to Him. We're married to Him. We're the bride of Christ. He's the husband that we are to serve and to live for. Yes. Look at verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to Him. Hey, listen. Th this is it right here. I'm, I'm going to start over. I want you to get this. Verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, Ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ that ye should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. When you came to Jesus Christ, we become dead to the old man serving under sin. You can walk up to a dead man at a funeral who's laid out in a casket and if he had a nicotine addiction, you can light up a cigarette and put that cigarette in his face and I can guarantee you one thing, he's not going to draw on that cigarette. Why? Because he's dead. You can blow smoke in his face. You could give him the whole pack. It's not going to make any difference. Why? Because he's dead. Bless him, God. So, we're dead to the law by the body of Christ. When you came to Christ, that old man had to die. We're talking about dying to Christ in order to live a victorious life. So let me sum it up tonight. As a believer, we are married to Christ. Yeah. Then... At that point, if you go off and you put your faith and trust in something else, 
You are committing spiritual adultery. So he's saying to us tonight, once you give your life to Jesus Christ, you give your loyalty, you give your pledge, you give your faith, your trust to Jesus, you have been married to Jesus. When you put your faith in Christ and what He did on the cross, you are in effect saying, Lord, I am connecting with you. You died for me, but I'm dying also to my old life. That old man is dying out. You see, I'm becoming a new man or a new woman because of resurrection power. If we try to serve both, it becomes spiritual adultery and then you're going out on Jesus. Yep. <coughs> this is what happens when you try to place your faith and trust in two different places. This woman in Romans chapter 7, it says she can't get married until her first husband's dead. Well, how does he die? When I come to Jesus. When I come to Jesus. I shift my faith from myself. I shift my faith from my religion. From my education. Or whatever it may be. And I put my trust in Jesus Christ. And what He has done for my salvation and sanctification. And I'm walking with the Lord on a daily basis. Amen. Now the old man has... Listen. Lord let him get this. The old man has been put to death when you come to Jesus Christ. And now, talking about the law, when you come to Christ, you're not under that anymore. And now, sin shall not have control over you. How many of us tonight understand that if you are someone who's truly saved, if you're really saved, Sin is not going to have control over your life. Now, don't raise your hand or anything right here. But how many of you understand tonight that you might be letting that happen? Why? Why does that old man want to keep getting up, raising up in your life, Telling people off. Trusting in something other than Christ and what He's done. That old man wants control. And so when we feed him, yeah. we're putting ourselves back under that dominion. Yes. Again. You see, your life is supposed to be burden free. Now, that doesn't mean you'll never have a problem. That doesn't mean you'll never have to weather the storm. That doesn't mean that you'll never go through any trouble, but as long as you have Jesus Christ, it's going to be all right. So, in Christ, the law died and we are made free from its restrictions. How many of us understand tonight that speeding, if you're driving down the interstate in a vehicle and you get pulled over for speeding, you get a ticket for that. How many of you understand that speeding is still speeding whether it's one mile over or 25 miles over? Mm -hmm. It's still speeding. It doesn't matter. When you subject yourself to putting your faith in something other than Jesus Christ and you break one of the many hundreds of the laws that we can mention from God's Word tonight, guess what? I heard somebody say, you broke them all. You broke them all. Some people think they've done something by coming to church. And like we've already established here tonight, and I, I believe everyone here understands this, you should come to church. <coughs> but some people really think they've really accomplished something for some uh, you know, eternal good of their own righteousness, of their own accord, just because they walk through the doors and they say, Lord... Here I am. But if you're saved, you'll want to be here. Well, I read my Bible today. Well, that's good. If you're saved and you love the Lord, you'll want to do that. Well, I prayed today. Well, if you love God, you'll want to do that. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. You see? It's not a law unto me. It's not a grievous burden that I have to bear going to church. 
If I have to call you every service and say, hey, are you coming to church tonight? And you say, well, I don't know. I'm thinking about it. But you know, we're awful tired. We're just tired. A lot of folks may not understand exactly where I'm at in my life and in my ministry right now. <laughs> if you want to serve the Lord, come on and get on board. Because I can't follow up everybody in there, brother. And Jesus Christ didn't even do that. I love you. I'll check on you. I'll visit you when I can. <coughs> but if you're determined to run away, come on somebody. Yeah. You've got to understand that this is not just a part of what I do, but this is who I am. Yes. And nobody in this world has to twist my arm to get me to go to church or to pray or to read the Bible or to pay my tithes or to give offerings. I'm trying to help somebody tonight because some people have been coming to church for years only because they felt like everybody's eyes was on them and they feel constrained to do it. They're coming out of obligation. We need to drop all of that nonsense. Because if you're only coming because you feel constrained to come or because you feel like it's some grievous burden to you but you just feel like it, you know that's just part of the obligation that you have, you're not coming for the right reasons. But when you love the Lord and you're doing these things for the right reasons, then you'll not only give to the kingdom of God but you'll be faithful to the kingdom of God and you'll serve the Lord with gladness. And we'll enter His gates with thanksgiving. And we'll enter His courts with praise. And these things will happen not because I'm constrained to do it, because I love the Lord. Yes, sir. And I'm thankful for what He's done for me in my life. After all that He's done for me, that's what I need to do. I need to give Him my best. I need to live for Him. And if it makes no difference, whether it's one mile or ten miles, I still broke the law. And when you get yourself up under the law, the law has no mercy. The law has no grace. The law can care less. You just become a number. Nothing more than a number. But when you serve the Lord fully and completely, you'll be free from all of that. As Melissa comes, listen, I'm going to say this and we'll give you an opportunity to pray if you need to pray tonight. I've been in a lot of churches. I've been a member of a couple of them. And I've seen a lot of different things over the years. But if you create a culture or an atmosphere in a church to where it's about something other than Jesus Christ and what He's done, Nobody's going to get saved. Nobody's going to die out to sin. And sooner or later, the church is going to die out. That congregation will because nobody can live up to it. But when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's liberty. There's liberty in Him. Would you pray with us tonight? Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you for this uh, time together here tonight. I pray in the name of Jesus. May the Spirit of God speak to hearts and soften hearts, God, I pray in this place tonight. And I pray, dear God, that you'll move in this congregation 